Okay, everybody, welcome to the ninth annual Soil and Nutrition Conference in 2019. We are starting the conference off this year with Jim Oshman, who is going to give us a lecture about consciousness. We all know how important consciousness is in growing our plants, but we are now going to have an expert for the next three hours, so hold on tight. And um, I would like to introduce Jim, who's a colleague and friend for many years. Jim is trained as a biophysicist, but he really studies everything and um, incorporates all of the different scientific knowledge that he's acquired over the last 60 odd years uh, to understand consciousness and energy medicine. Uh, he, he's so prolific in his knowledge that he's had to write several books. Uh, for example, uh, the classic Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis, which was published in 2000, and the book called Energy Medicine in Therapeutics and Human Performance. So the point being that he's written many books and over 100 articles, scientific technical articles, in very many different aspects of energy medicine everything from microcurrent to um, feng shui to uh, earthing, one of his famous books, to consciousness. And today, he's going to talk to us about consciousness. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I've been doing this for 80 years. Um, if you don't watch out, the same thing could happen to you. I suddenly became 80 years old. I didn't have to do anything in particular. It just happened. Thank you, Delinda, and thank you, Dan, for the invitation. Um, if you have questions, you can email me, uh, joshman at aol.com, questions or comments. It may take me six months to reply because I have 40,000 emails. <laughs> Oh well. Um, energy medicine is natural medicine. <clears throat> Here are some examples. Um, headaches and water. We are taught that we should, if we have a headache, we should take an aspirin and drink a glass of water. The usual reason we have a headache is because we're dehydrated and our headache goes away because of the glass of water, not because of the aspirin. So the aspirin bottle should say, in case of a headache, drink a glass of water. But it doesn't. Heimlich. I met Heimlich, the guy who invented the Heimlich maneuver. He was a, quite a gentleman. Um, he described how little children have severe asthma attacks and they have to be rushed to the hospital to get an atropine injection. They can do, you can do the Heimlich maneuver on them they can learn how to do it themselves so that when they have an, an asthma attack and they get a plug at the bottom of their uh, windpipe, they just go whoop, like that, and their asthma attack is over, and if they do it a few times, they never get asthma attacks again. So I was very impressed with Heimlich, and I talked to him. I told him how much I appreciated his work. He said, well, the asthma thing, every... Uh, after every newscast, there are all these advertisements for asthma and respiratory relief, and I don't have the money to advertise, so people don't know this simple thing that they can do that's free. Too bad. And then he said, the thing that I really did that was important, I got invited to Vietnam. They gave me an award because I had saved the lives of 10,000 Vietnamese soldiers during the Vietnam War. <clears throat> the way he did that was he invented a little device. He said, I'm a thoracic surgeon. This is very simple. If you get shot in the chest, the problem is pneumothorax, your, your lungs collapse. Uh, blood builds up and squishes your lungs. So I made this one-way valve. It costs 50 cents. You stick it in the bullet hole, and it lets... Uh, it lets the blood out without letting air in. Very simple. 
Every soldier carries one of the Heimlich valves. I think I got that right. <laughs> Arian, yeah. And jet lag. Um, I know how to get rid of jet lag. Some people suffer severely from jet lag. All you have to do is take your shoes and socks off and go outside and stand in the grass for 15 minutes and the jet lag will go away because you will be plugging in through your feet to the local um, rhythms of the new place where you are. And it works great. I don't do it because I like jet lag. So I milk my jet lag for as long as I can because usually I'm arriving in Europe and I have to give a talk and I like waking up wide awake at 3 a.m. so I can finish my talk. So I like, jet lag is my friend, but um, some people are really bothered by it. We need to take care of each other. Um, and that's what this is about. Um, antenna theory is a very important theory. When a structure has properties that enable it to emit a field, it will also be a good receiver of a field. And that'll be important as we go through this story. Our hearts are bi-directional antennas. They emit and take in scalar fields. And you probably haven't heard of scalar fields. Lots of people don't know what a scalar field is. Um, <clears throat> and that's too bad because scalar fields are very interesting, very important in relationship to consciousness. Scalar fields are what project from our heart into the, the um, what I call the quantum information field. And the quantum information field is the source of our insights and inspirations and great ideas. So really what consciousness is, is about, the story of, and, and what I do is I, I figure out how things work. Uh, I don't do experiments, I just answer questions People come up to me, they have a gadget that is, has healing properties, and they say, how does this work? Um, just to give you an example, <clears throat> I have this thing on my cell phone, um, and it comes from Spain, and I met the inventor. I liked him. He was an elderly gentleman who created this device to protect us from Wi-Fi, and it was entirely through dreams and inspiration. I like that, when somebody invents something, allows it to come in, rather than, you know, tinker, tinker, tinker. And they tested it at five universities in Spain, and it always worked. They did some very careful tests. None of the scientists could figure out how does it work. Jim, can you explain how this works? I said, sure. I had no idea. But I have faith in my intuition. And that if I wait long enough, the answers will come. Maybe that's my main message about consciousness. If you need an answer to a question, it'll come. Be patient. Ask the question, and you'll get an answer. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, who developed the geodesic dome and tensegrity and so on, said, when I need a tool to further the evolution of consciousness, it arrives. It may not be immediate, but it comes. So that's, that's the story that I want to tell, how that works. How does it work that we get the information we need? So our hearts are bi-directional antennas. This is what um, energetic... Um, what's my title? It's in my title. Uh, hygiene. Ah, hygiene. Because our thoughts affect our bodies immediately. And our thoughts affect the people around us immediately. And this happens through the energy fields. So we are immersed in each other's heart fields. And what we think changes the field immediately and through some very interesting processes that have been worked out called 
immediate early genes. Um, Dawson Church lectures about this. Uh, the genes change, and some of them are some of the changes happen in less than a minute. So that's how sensitive our bodies and our genome is to our thinking. Uh, great work from Institute of Heart Math, the Energetic Heart. I love what these people do. I, if I gave Nobel Prizes, I would give one to them because they have figured out the relationship between our emotions and the electricity of our hearts. And the electricity, the heart's electricity, goes everywhere in the body. Every time your heart beats, every water molecule in your body goes bloop, 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 bloop. They wiggle. So everything. You can pick up the electrocardiogram in your feet. So it's a signal that the heart produces. And I will show you my toys because often I get halfway through the lecture and I realize I haven't talked about my toys. This is a model of a heart, which I'll explain where it came from. It's a uh, model of the ventricles. It was a huge problem in anatomy for hundreds of years. The world's greatest anatomists beat their brains out trying to figure out the structure of the ventricles and a Spanish cardiologist figured it out it took him 50 years, and he found, and I'll show you the video, he, he dissected the, a cow's heart with his hands, and it unrolled, the ventricle unrolled, into a single band of muscle, which in the intact heart coils up as a double helix. And there is resonance between objects of similar geometry. So the heart's geometry is a double helix, the DNA is a double helix, even though it's much smaller. So the heart electricity, the heart frequencies, are resonating with every DNA molecule in the body. And that's important. That's a means of connecting things together. Um, I had somebody took my heart and they, they broke it. It cracked right along here. And I fixed it with super glue. So it's good to know if you have a broken heart, you can fix it with super glue. And it's a very interesting place where it breaks. And I think there could be therapies for broken hearted people based on this information that came from the Spanish gentleman. His name was Guasp, G U A S P. Um, the place where the heart where the model breaks is a place where the fibers in one layer are in the opposite direction to the fibers in the layer underneath. And that is a very important place. It makes the heart a Mobius strip. And a Mobius strip is one type of scalar field antenna. It makes the heart a scalar, a bidirectional scalar field antenna. If you want to read about that, we wrote some papers um, about the heart as a bidirectional scalar um, field antenna. Um, you can find those papers on my website, energyresearch.us. So if you want to read the papers, the uh, papers were of great interest to lots of people. And I got invited to send more papers. It's in the Journal of Vortex Science and Technology. I'm very interested in vortices. OK. Uh, they've demonstrated that emotions are reflected in the heart rhythm patterns. And this is the heart rate variability, the heart rhythm pattern uh, making an intentional shift from a state of frustration to a genuine feeling of appreciation simply by refocusing their thoughts. So when the policeman arrests you for, for speeding and you're upset and you're going to have to pay a ticket, 
and you're frustrated, your job is to get out of the frustration as soon as you can because it's not good for you. Um, somebody asked the Dalai Lama, Your Holiness, what do you do when your friend dies? And the Dalai Lama said, Oh, you are very sad. But you don't stay sad too long because it's not good for you. Well, he was speaking this truth that they've demonstrated experimentally um, that the heart's electricity is affected by your attitude. So be grateful for the policeman for slowing you down. Uh, don't thank him, though. He might think you're a wise guy. So here are some nice illustrations of people, people's heart-to-heart -heart communications. Um, and the laws of physics, and one of the laws is Ampere's law, which says that when an electric current moves, a magnetic field is created in the surrounding space. So every heartbeat produces a wave of electricity that travels through the circulatory system down to your feet and back up again. The circulatory system is a very good conductor of electricity and that affects every cell in your body and every water molecule. 99% uh, of the molecules in your body are water. <clears throat> Glenn and I were just at the water conference in Germany where we had an interesting time listening to very exciting new research on water some of which I'll mention. Um, this diagram was made by Richard Gordon, who wrote a book on polarity therapy in the 1970s. I got the book. He explained how to do polarity therapy. It's not the same as going to the Polarity Therapy Institute and studying the methods for months to really learn the details, but his book gave you the basic techniques, and they work. They work great. They work at a distance, in fact. Um, one of my friends had a, had a health issue, and I imagined myself walking into his house and going into his bedroom and putting my hands over his body the way they describe in polarity therapy, and it worked. I was down the street, but it worked. Um, and he got better. And what's really neat about this diagram is that this is the field of the heart that Richard Gordon felt with his hands. And I like that I, because somehow, even though I'm a scientist, I have the ability to feel people's energy fields, and probably many of you do, and if you don't think you do, you probably do anyway. We can all do this. It's so easy and it's so powerful. Um, people are surprised when you go, you go like that and you go, oh, too bad about your right knee. And they say, well, how did you know my knee, right knee is bothering me? Because it's in the field. And pathology, you can sense. Healthy tissue does not advertise itself in terms of a distorted field um, because it's healthy. Pathology shows up in the field. <clears throat> so I like this because Richard Gordon felt this field with his hands. He made a diagram, and it turned out that as he was writing his book, scientists at a New Age institution called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology were actually measuring the biofield, the biomagnetic field of the body, and guess what it looks like? Richard Gordon was right, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> and some years later, I went to a conference in Boston um, on biomagnetism. It turns out that there are thousands of laboratories around the world. I mean, just people are skeptical about that there is a field around the body. There are thousands of researchers. Look up biomagnetism on Google, 
and you will find thousands of websites, bioelectricity, um, and so on. So these fields are real and they're measured every day. So the heart's field and the heart's field affects everything. Uh, and this is nice, nice diagram of communication of affection. The energetic heart. The coherent heart. Heart-brain interactions. Psychophysiological coherence. And the emergence of system-wide order. And I understand that coherence is an important subject in uh, growing plants. So study coherence. Um, an excellent place to learn about coherence is the work of Mei Wan Ho, H-O. She was a British biophysicist, and she wrote many very interesting and important biophysics articles about coherence and water, and they were published in her journal, which was called ISIS, the Institute for Science in Society. And Mei Wan was a brilliant biophysicist. She was a brilliant artist, and she didn't like Monsanto. She called them, she said, this is uh, Frankenstein science. And due to her um, acquaintance with the Prince of Wales, uh, Monsanto sent their scientists to see uh, the Prince of Wales and explained to him that Monsanto was going to be able, with their genetically modified crops, would be able to feed the world. And they couldn't get in to see him. Uh, May Wan had talked to him and said, if those guys show up, don't bother talking to them. And so he didn't. Old stories. The heart's intuitive intelligence, a path to personal, social, and global coherence and plant physiology. Oh, sweet. So these are some nice uh, diagrams from the heart math people. Um, the heart is a helical structure. Um, there are, we wrote some papers on um, the helical fabric of the heart and space. Space itself is, that surrounds us and that we're immersed in, that extends the space inside of our bodies is continuous with all space, all the way out to the distant stars and galaxies. Space has a spiral grain. And a scientist by the name of Ginsberg wrote five books on this subject, The Spiral Grain of the Universe. And this is very important for understanding how the heart can resonate with space. Um, I brought this, this model. This is Tensegrity. Tensegrity developed originally by a sculptor by the name of Snelson <clears throat> and kind of Buckminster Fuller kind of took it over and designed a lot of structures. Um, tensegrity means tensional integrity. And basically, Fuller recognized that plants and animals use both compression resistant structures and tension resistant structures. So these are called tendons. They resist tension. And these are called struts. And they're like bones. They resist compression. Although bones actually are tensegrity structures, they have um, compression resistant elements. Those are the bone minerals and tension resistant elements called collagen. Um, collagen is the basic building block of the human body. Um, collagen is a triple helix. This is a collagen molecule magnified 4,500,000 times. I got it at the um, hardware store. 
It's a triple helix, like this manila rope is a triple helix. And the way you make a very strong structure is you take a lot of fibers that are left-handed helices and you twist them together in a right-handed helix. And then you can take a bunch of these and twist them together the opposite way and you keep going back and forth in terms of the direction of twists and you can end up with a rope that's this big that's strong enough to hold a battleship to the dock <clears throat> or a tugboat. Um, collagen is a very uh, flexible molecule. In the body, it's, the molecules are stacked together in a crystalline arrangement. Um, this is not appreciated by modern biomedical researchers. They do not appreciate the fact that much of our body is crystalline. Um, when we think of crystals, we think of mineral crystals like diamond and agate. They're made from spherical atoms that are stacked tightly together, and they're very hard. The collagen in the body is likewise stacked together in arrays, crystalline arrays, but the molecules are flexible. So our tissue doesn't feel like a crystal, but it has the properties of crystals, and crystals, in terms of physics, are very interesting materials, and they resonate, and plants are made of crystalline materials as well, which is very important. So this, um, you have about a trillion miles of this protein in your body, enough to go to the moon and back several times, I think. Um, and it's important stuff. Um, there are conferences on fascia, fascia research congresses. And I've been to most of them, and they're very interesting. There are lots of scientists working on connective tissue, collagen, its physical properties, and how to deal with um, injuries. There's a lot to learn about collagen. I gave a seminar in Denver a few years ago, and there was a Snelson sculpture outside the hotel in a park. It was a, uh, based on this principle, and I went and looked at it. I was admiring it, and a guy came by, and he said, I like this thing. You know, when the wind blows, it sings, and the wind vibrates the tendons, and they make a sound. And there's a name for that. It's called Aeolian Vibrations, named after Aeolus, the Greek god of the winds. Um, it's an interesting design for the human body because the more you load it, the stronger it gets. That's a good thing. <clears throat> if you have an injury, an impact is conducted through the network. As long as tensional integrity is there, if the struts touch each other, that's not tensional integrity. So the Struts have to be suspended in the web of uh, tendons. And these are places where there's stuckness. And these are places that break when you fall down. So athletes are very interested in having their tensional network organized uh, so that if they fall down, they will be resilient. A good tensegrity structure is very resilient. If you distort it, it goes back to the way it was before. A desirable property for the human body. From the term uh, viewpoint of energy medicine, it's a valuable concept because if you pluck one of the tendons, the vibrations go through the whole network. Boing. And lots of energy medicine is based on putting vibrational frequencies into the body. 
so I, I brought this to show you. Uh, this is um, electrical and light spiraling through the heart uh, ventricles. Each heartbeat does this, and each heartbeat projects the status of your heart, your feelings, the tone of your life into space. Here is uh, Dr. Gwasp. I never met him. What happened was I was reading Gray's Anatomy. You can't read Gray's Anatomy. It's this thick. It weighs 10 pounds. It's a huge book. But I was reading the section on the heart, and there was a reference to the electric circulation. I thought that sounded very interesting because I was looking for the way energy moves through the body. I learned from therapists that they work with the energy systems of the body. What are these energy systems? What are they? What are you talking about? So I was very interested to see a, an article, the electric circulation. I asked, I was working at, uh, in Woods Hole at the Marine Biological Laboratory, which has the best library in the world. If you want to find out anything, that's the place to go. They have all of the journals. They have complete sets of all of the journals. The A's are on the top floor and the Z's are on the bottom floor. You can find any scientific article in a few seconds if you're willing to run up and down the stairs. And so I asked the librarian for this article. It took her a month. She came back and she said, that article on um, the electric circulation does not exist anywhere in the United States. I suggest you write to the editors of the book. So I wrote to Peter Warwick in London, and I got a letter back saying, yes, Dr. Gwasp has written that article. He comes to London sometimes. He's an interesting man. Here's his address. He lives in Spain, in Dina, Spain. And so I wrote to him. And he sent back a big pile of reprints, one of which was the electrical circulation. Dear Dr. Oshman, thank you for your interest in my work. And the reason he did that, I think, is because Spanish cardiologists thought he was nuts. And this is the way it is with any new discovery or new idea in science. Science absolutely depends on new discoveries and new ideas Scientists hate new discoveries and new ideas. So it took him 50 years to dissect the heart and find out that it has this double helical structure. And it finally registered with the Spanish cardiologists. It turns out to be an important discovery in cardiology. They've had conferences at the National Institutes of Health. And he's now world famous. And he was right. 50 years. So when I wrote to him, he was very happy to get a letter from a, an American scientist. And let's see if I can... This is a discussion of the how the structure of the heart has not changed much over the last 300 years. Um, we don't have to worry about that. We'll get to Dr. Gwasp. It's the myocardial ventricular band, and he's going to dissect it. He is, this is a cow heart. He's boiled it to loosen up the connective tissue, and then he takes it apart with his bare hands. And it took him 50 years to get to the point where he could show this, the interior ventricular sulcus. This is, these are anatomical terms uh, used to describe the fascial planes in the heart. And here he goes. He's breaking open the connective tissue so that he can he can separate the different pieces. And he's unrolling it. 
by the way, I am in touch with his colleagues in Spain, and we've actually written a paper together. And the description is anatomical. It's talking about the layers of fibers, which I mentioned, and how they're going in different directions, in different layers. And that's the place, I think, it's a crossover place where the uh, ventricles become a Mobius strip, and I think it's what enables you to be intuitive. I think the broken heart, every, every one of us has probably had a broken heart at one time or another, rejection or whatever, and it doesn't feel good, and it gets to something really fundamental in us, which is our intuitive capacity. Fortunately, there's super glue. Okay, uh, there's a resonance between the double helical heart and DNA, and Glenn has done research on this with uh, McCready at HeartMath, right? You're going to talk about that? Very good, very cool. This is a, an Escher, M.C. Escher painting of a Mobius strip with ants crawling on it. It has one surface. It's a very interesting geometry. It has one surface. And that has very interesting implications in terms of quantum physics. Um, and here is an example. I don't have the sound, but that's okay. Uh, this is a, a uh, stairwell illusion um, based on Escher's work. And figure this out. Figure out how this works. This is the Escherian stairway. It goes up the stairs, and he's at the bottom of the stairs. How about that? And she's a graduate student, and she's going to demonstrate it also. This is a pretty good trick. Well, go up the stairs, wait for me on the next floor. How do you do that? She's a little bewildered. <laughs> Try it with a glass of water. Okay. Can you figure that out, Glenn? So here's tensegrity. One of the interesting things about tensegrity is that it permits mass to be far away from the center, from the base of support. So I can hold this out in space because my body is a tensegrity structure. Biotensegrity, Steve Levin, MD, an orthopedic surgeon, was at 
the Smithsonian looking at dinosaurs. And he noticed the dinosaurs are enormous and some of them have enormously long tails that extend way out into space. And he looked at the legs of the dinosaurs and he thought, how can that support all that weight? And he decided maybe it's tensegrity. And it turned out that he was right. And there's a lot of good stuff on his website, biotensegrity.com. He is the king of this field. He invented it. They have conferences every year in uh, the USA and Europe. There's a lot of biotensegrity nuts around, and I'm one of them. Uh, this is a model of the spine. And what's interesting about this is we learn that the spine is a stack of bricks. It's like a stack, the, the vertebrae are like bricks stacked on top of each other to bear weight. It's not like that. It turns out that each of the vertebrae is actually suspended above the one below by the soft tissues. This is extremely important therapeutically. Uh, the Rolfers know about this. If you have a back problem and your, your intervertebral discs are compressed and maybe even bulging, you need to get the vertebrae back into the lift mode. And you can do that with body work by strengthening the ligaments that actually support each vertebra above the one below. It's, that's the design of the human body. <clears throat> so if you have back trouble, body work works that way. It can get the lift back into your spine so that your um, vertebrae are not touching each other. This is a wonderful model. It doesn't have any intervertebral discs. The vertebrae are held above each other through the soft tissues, the tendons and ligaments in the soft tissues. Tom Flemons in Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, makes these models. They're beautiful. And they really show that this is something that works. So the definition, a continuous tensional network, tendons, supported by a discontinuous set of compressive elements, struts. And in a lot of cases, body workers find places in the body where the struts are stuck to each other and they unglue them and tensegrity, tensional integrity is restored. The cell's matrix is held together by tension. A diagram from Johns Hopkins. This is a complete tensegrity structure of the body. Uh, the skeleton can walk, sit, stretch, and contort. It will stand self-supporting with all of the compression elements, the bones floating in the web of tension woven around it from top to bottom. Fantastic. It's fantastic. It applies to the whole body. This is a uh, rabbit, and you can see what's holding his head up is this web of tensional elements and all through the body. Um, so it applies to the whole body, to the cell, the cytoskeleton, the nucleus. This is a nucleus made out of um, popsicle sticks and rubber bands. And it, just, it shows the uh, tensional net, uh, network in the cell nucleus. And this is a model of space, one of many models of space. We don't know how space is structured at a very, very fine scale. We can't see um, at what's called the Planck scale. We can't see it with any microscope. But this is from Sir Roger Penrose, and he describes the fabric of space as a spin network. Spin is very important. Spin is how water goes up in plants, for just as an example. Yeah. 
I, uh, how many of you watched the movie last night? Not everybody. At the risk of being redundant, I'm just going to do my brief introduction to the movie again. Um, and you can see it, I think, tonight also. Is it tonight? Tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Yeah, I won't be there to narrate and introduce it. I have to go home, but um, this is optimizing your whole system with earthing or grounding your body. Uh, fantastic. I've been involved in this project for something like um, almost 20 years. Um, the guy who figured this out, his name is Clint Ober. He was trying to get scientists involved to figure out why it is that going barefoot on the earth is so good for you and affects so many different systems in the body and nobody at the university was interested. So Clint set up a, uh, <clears throat> a business of supplying products that can connect you to the earth uh, like while you're sleeping, and while you're sitting at your computer and so on. And he made some money from selling these products and he reinvested it in research. And so there's been over 20 studies published. I'm not a physician. I'm not giving you a diagnosis or recommendation for treatment, but this stuff really works. These are my books uh, that Glenn mentioned. Uh, it was been translated into a bunch of languages. I gave a talk in France and they had the book ready for the French. Uh, they had the French edition. These are the scientists. Um, this fellow is a, an MD, PhD in Poland. And he started research at the same time as Clint Ober and found out very similar things. Totally independent from our work. Research reports, earthinginstitute.net. <clears throat> Under research, you can read my papers and other papers of others. We used to sleep and walk directly on the earth. That was a good thing. And in the late 50s, we started putting plastic on the bottoms of our shoes. This was the most unhealthy invention ever. Our health went downhill immediately when we started wearing plastic on the bottom of our feet. High-rise buildings, uh, every... The uh, Medicare did a study and they found that the higher you live in a high-rise, the greater your chances of having a stroke. And the reason is, the higher you li live, uh, your voltage on the top of your head increases by about 450 volts for every floor. If you're on the 10th floor, 4,500 volts above ground plane, ground level, and it's not good for you, not good for your head. So here's Mr. Shoes, not too happy. He's not contacting the electrons in the earth. Uh, I'd never have my dog wear shoes. And this is Mr. Barefoot, and he's happy because he's connected to the electrons. They come from the sun to the ionosphere and charge the ionosphere, and periodically the ionosphere belches electrons to the earth. It's called lightning. There's no lightning here right now, but somewhere on the earth there are thousands of lightning strikes per minute. So that's a continuous flow of electrons, sun, ionosphere, and to the earth. The earth's surface is conductive. If you're standing barefoot on the earth or barefoot on a pad that is electrically coupled to the earth, you're grounded and the, there's a continuous flow of lightning, of lightning of electrons into your body. <clears throat> and this happens very fast. Uh, the book has been translated into a bunch of language, languages. Millions of people around the world know about earthing. We've had incredible feedback from these people. 
And what I can tell you, I've studied the feedback, I've studied the um, people report, and all kinds of health problems go away when you get grounded. It's unbelievable. And here are some of the, this is a list. We've had reports from all over the world on these different conditions that respond to connecting to the earth. And this is just about deficiency diseases. Um, the British in the 1700s, half of the sailors died of scurvy on a long voyage. No, nobody understood why. <clears throat> scurvy was, uh, we now know, was caused by a lack of vitamin C. Napoleon met his Waterloo at the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. The major factor in the British defeat of Napoleon were limes. And this is why British sailors are called limeys, um, because they used limes, and that limes are loaded with vitamin C, and they didn't get scurvy. Scurvy saved lots of people. So these are the deficiency diseases. They're very serious until we figure out what's been missing, and I've listed electron deficiency as a deficiency disease. It affects millions of people, causes all kinds of aches and pains, and for example, all of the um, autoimmune disorders respond very quickly to earthing, connecting to the earth. Your immune system cannot function properly without electrons, and the body has a storehouse of electrons in the soft tissues in what's called the ground substance. It's the soft material between the collagen molecules. It's a polyelectrolyte, and it's a vast store of electrons. We need those electrons to be in place. If we don't have them, we're electron deficient. Um, athletes, before any event, I tell them, spend 15 minutes with your feet on the ground, bare feet on the ground, and you'll have more energy because you need electrons for your electron transport chains in your mitochondria that give you ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy source for all the things that go on in your body. And these are the symptoms of electron deficiency in the order in which we discovered them. First thing we found was insomnia. Millions of people have insomnia. Millions of Americans can't sleep well. Grounding. It takes a couple of minutes to put a grounding pad on your bed, put a sheet over it, and sleep on it for the rest of your life, which will be longer. Your life will be longer because aging is caused by, it is thought, the leading theory of aging is uh, cumulative damage caused by free radicals. That will not happen if you're grounded. It can't happen. The reason people can't sleep is because they have inflammation. <clears throat> inflammation causes pain. You can't sleep because you're in pain. Uh, stress, your body is stressed. Grounding relieves stress. It affects the um, hormones, the, auto, the, the uh, autonomic nervous system. These are all, each of these is represented by papers published in peer-reviewed journals. Autoimmune disorders, disturbed, and this is the, the guys in Poland uh, found the disturbed sugar metabolism and hormonal balance. All cardiovascular issues are affected by earthing. Earthing thins the blood if you have a loved one who has any cardiovascular issue of any kind, get them to take their shoes and socks off and get out there with their bare feet on the grass or get them grounded at night or during the day. Yes? Uh, cement is okay. 
Um, sidewalks are okay. Uh, um, basements with a cement floor, if it hasn't been sealed, you have to make sure. And there's a way to find out if the places in your home are grounded. Uh, you get a, a voltmeter and you attach the voltmeter, you put your thumb on one terminal, the other terminal is connected to a wire stuck in the ground outside, so you're measuring the electrical potential between the earth and your body. And if you wander around your home dragging a long wire that's connected to the earth, watching the voltmeter, you will see that when you get next to your electric range, the voltage goes up. When you go in your bedroom, the voltage goes up because there are wires behind your bed, wires in the wall that are radiating 60 cycle electricity. So you can find out where the hot spots are. I, uh, <clears throat> I gave a workshop in Atlanta and there was a woman in the class who had totally rewired her home. She was worried about 60 cycle fields. So she had a new uh, electric box and new wiring coming into the house. She asked me to check it out with my voltmeter. And I checked it out and I found out that where she had a desk where she paid her bills and answered her mail was very electrically active. On the other side of that wall was her refrigerator with a rotating magnetic field. The refrigerators have uh, motors in them. Rotating magnetic fields are not good for you. So she did her best, but she didn't realize that her desk was in the wrong place. Aging, I mentioned. Um, it has to slow aging. Yes. Good question. Would geothermal systems in a home affect the grounding? And I don't know anything about that. I would expect it would. Um, the, the thing that saves us is taking a shower because the water comes through metal pipes in the ground and picks up electrons. So when you take a shower, you restore your electron balance in your body. So that's why if you feel tired and funky, uh, and you take a shower, you have you feel energized, you feel better. So for the purposes of the recording, this is these are questions and discussion about geothermal heating systems and whether that brings electrons or the Earth's field into your home. I don't know the answer. Uh, one of our participants says that, and I think it must be a transfer of the heat from the water, from the earth, to a circulating fluid. And whether that fluid is grounded or not, I don't know. Always good to check out. Um, we find that people who are not well, often their bed place is highly electrified. They may have 20 volts on their body. And that's not good. All the electrical systems in the body need this. They need the ground. It's called the ground plane in electronics. It's every electronic device is grounded for good reasons. I don't know the answer about seizures. A lot of people have electrical problems. Uh, I know of one, a guy who had, he had to shock his heart every morning to get started in the day. And that was unpleasant. After he slept grounded, he didn't have to do that anymore. So it's good for all the electrical systems in your body. Um, I don't know if it would affect this device, which is called a what? A VNS. A VNS. I don't know. Uh, I would guess that it wouldn't do any harm and be worth trying out. Yeah, this is a question about a transplant and immune suppressants and would grounding affect that? And I would guess that it would be beneficial. 
It's a guess. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a, able to make a recommendation. I would guess it would help. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, there's a description of it on the uh, website earthinginstitute.net. It's um, basically the first thing Clint gave me was a voltmeter. One of the terminals had a thumb terminal so I could put my thumb on it. The other one you could either stick into the electrical grounding system or connect to a rod outside in the earth. Very instructive to walk around your home and see what kinds of voltages you're picking up on your body. Um, but there is a description, a detailed description. Everybody is different in their responses. Some people actually have a negative first experience because they're detoxing. And so if you are detoxing by being grounded, you need to take it easy and like just try 15 minutes a day and build up to longer periods. But everybody responds differently. You can put a grounding system in your car. Um, Clint went to a truck stop and he gave truckers grounding pads that they could put under their butts while they were traveling. And he said, you keep this, it's all yours. Here's a form, I'd like you to fill this out. Let me know what your experience is. They found that they could see better. They found that they, they had less back trouble. Um, lots of positive reports from the truckers. Basically, it's attaching a conductive pad to the frame of your car, to the metal frame. And tires have carb carbon in them. So the tires connect you to the earth. We recommend 15 minutes a day to build up your electron reservoirs. Uh, moccasins are good. There's an earthing distributor in Canada that sells moccasins. Le are you from Canada? Yeah, good idea. Doing away with leather-soled shoes was a disaster. Um, so get leather-soled shoes, moccasins, or whatever. And there are earthing shoes that have conductive soles. These ones from Canada aren't expensive. Uh, and I don't recommend copper, by the way. There are shoes called plugs, and they have a carbon plug that is conductive, right at kidney one. Every therapist knows about kidney one. Often a therapy session, the therapist will finish the session by putting their fingers on kidney one at the metatarsals on the bottoms of the feet. They're doing a good thing. They're putting electrons into the meridian system. The meridian system, the acupuncture meridians, go everywhere in the body and deliver electrons to every nook and cranny everywhere in your body. So that's a good thing to do. Here's what's going on in the body. This is the ground substance, the polyelectrolyte, and the ungrounded person. This is the charge reservoir. We call this electron depletion. This is the same system, the charge reservoir. These are covered with electrons. The reservoirs are filled. We call this inflammatory preparedness. You're ready for an injury. These are the neutrophils that deliver reactive oxygen species to any place where you have an injury. Uh, free radicals, but the FDA doesn't like free radicals, so we call them reactive oxygen species. And here's what happens. Mr. Shoes, ungrounded, the neutrophils are attacking an injured site, and what happens is the neutrophils in what's called the oxidative burst, a burst of free radicals that has a very important person, uh, purpose to <clears throat> um, destroy any pathogens 
that might have gotten into the body through the site of injury, also to clear away dead cells so that repair can take place. We call it the repair field, the place where cellular damage has to be taken care of. And what happens is the tissue around the site of injury can get attacked by the free radicals, and this sets up what's called a vicious cycle. The body recognizes that the injury is still there, sends more neutrophils, more free radicals, and it just continues and can go on for years. It's called silent inflammation. This is the cause, it appears, of all of the chronic diseases, including all of the diseases of aging, old injuries that have not completely resolved. Um, massage therapists know about this. They feel dense places. Other body workers feel dense places in the tissue. When you press on them, they go away. Those are old injuries that can potentially lead to chronic disease at some future time. So in the case of the grounded person, the reservoir is full of electrons. As soon as there's an injury, the neutrophils deliver free radicals. And if they diffuse into healthy tissue where they could cause damage, the electrons from the reservoirs neutralize the free radicals and the, the repair field heals very quickly and there's no lingering inflammation. That's how important this is. Um, in the last 20 years, I study energy medicine. The great discovery in Western medicine, research, tons of research showing that virtually every chronic disease is related to chronic inflammation, which is an energetic condition. I wrote the book on energy medicine. I was right. <laughs> Here's a Tour de France. This was a spoke wheel dug into the cyclist's leg, um, put grounding patches on it right next to it. Um, two days later, almost completely healed. What we find is the classic, and this has been known since uh, the Greeks, the classic pillars of inflammation, heat, pain, redness, loss of function, and something else. <laughs> there are five things that are known to happen with inflammation. They're all artifacts of being un ungrounded. They don't have to happen. If you get run over by a truck, Get your bare feet on the ground as soon as you can. Different ways of uh, sheets on the bed. We now have a pad that is very nice. It's very rugged, very conductive. The problem with the sheets is after you wash them for a few years, their conductivity goes away. And you have to get a new sheet. The new pads we have last forever. Your grandchildren can use them. You can put your feet when you're sitting at your computer. Uh, this one goes under your wrist. You cannot get carpal tunnel if you're grounded. You can't. It's an inflammatory condition. It won't happen. That's kidney one. Um, these are bracelets. Different ways to connect. Barefoot, rod in the ground, grounding terminal, and your electrical system. And most of the devices come with a tester that you can put in It'll check to make sure you have a good ground. Yes, yeah, well, hopefully you have a good ground in your home. But that's not always the case. And the grounding, the rod in the earth is the best, really, to make sure. Well, there's a tester that lights up if you have a good ground. And if you want to be sure, I would connect an oscilloscope to this and see what kinds of frequencies are there. Um, because the grounding system can pick up frequencies. I think, in my opinion, 
Sleeping grounded is definitely the way to go. It's so easy, so inexpensive. You spend a third of your life in bed, sleep grounded. It straightens everything out. It's really a good thing to do. Electric blankets are great for warming up your bed before you get in it. Then you unplug it. Electric blankets are not good for you. There's been research on electric blankets. There's been research on, <clears throat> in the Pacific Northwest, they electrified, they put wires under the floor, built into the floor to warm the floor. And then that created health problems. So there are problems with electric blankets. Good for warming, pre preheating your bed. There are all kinds of mats. <clears throat> There are all kinds of mats. There are mats with magnets in them, with um, crystals, mineral crystals. There are all kinds of mats. I met a guy who sold uh, mats with mineral crystals for cancer. And he says it works all the time. I don't know. I don't know if they've done research on it, but he was convinced. So yeah, there are all kinds of gadgets. I like anomalies. I like things that don't fit in with the way with the way we the things that we don't understand. And scientists don't like a lot of scientists don't like anomalies because what they've learned doesn't fit with the anomalies. To me, anomalies are a chance to learn something new, like life after death, or near-death experiences, and all kinds of things. They force you to think out of the box. So you can think outside. It's nice out. It's sunny. You don't even need a box. So this is an interesting observation, repeated many times. People who do not have brains. When you do an MRI of their head, where there's supposed to be a brain, there's water. My friend in Germany, Hendrik, said, well, maybe the water does all the consciousness things. And then Glenn chimed in, there's a lot of protein in the cerebrospinal fluid. Protein organizes water. So that was interesting. So this is hard for neuroscientists who spend their lives trying to figure out how the brain works by sticking microelectrodes into neurons. These people don't have that in their heads. And you know, I was always suspicious of the parts of the brain. The first thing that the scientist wants to do is tell you what the different parts do. Like where is memory in the brain? Is there a little box, a little structure that remembers things? Well, this is a problem. Oh dear. Hendrick, easy water. Easy water is what the water conference was about in Germany. It's easy to remember. It's because it's called EZ. It's exclusion zone water. It's water next to a surface that excludes solutes. Dissolved things can't get in there. I'll show you a little more about it. Glenn said it contains a lot of protein that can structure water. 15 to 45 milligrams per deciliter. Deciliter. Deciliter? Deciliter. There he is. The existence of people, mostly post hydrocephalics, who seem to be missing most of their brain tissue, calls into question some of the cherished assumptions of neuroscience.
It's a big anomaly. This fellow, Lorber, ran the spinal bifida unit at a hospital in England. He studied 60 people who had 95% of their brains replaced by fluid. Half of them had an IQ of over 100. What is going on here? Here's a student who measured uh, 126 IQ, had a mathematics degree, could play the piano. He didn't have any discernible brain matter at all. This is the classic paper, is your brain really necessary? <laughs> uh, the orthodox view is that information relating to long-term memory is held within the brain in some chemical or physical form. This guy says that we need to consider the possibility that memory is stored somewhere else, and maybe it's stored outside of the body. I think he's right, and a lot of scientists agree that memory, consciousness, is not in our heads. Cloud storage. Memory in the fabric of space. Carl Jung said psyche is not in the head or the brain. Lots of serious scholars have said the same thing. Here's a bunch of them. Uh, mind, learning, memory, the unconscious and consciousness are not confined to the brain. And these are pretty uh, high power folks. John Veltheim is a friend of mine. He developed body talk, which is a consciousness-based therapy. Listening to the body talk about what's going on. Almost all alternative therapies teach distant healing, prayer and distant healing. The skeptics will say that's ridiculous because there's no scientific basis for it. They're wrong. There is a scientific basis for prayer and distant healing, and it's in the quantum information field. So once the therapist knows how to connect, through the quantum information field, their patient can be thousands of miles away, and there are lots of therapists now don't want to see you in their office. They only do distant work. <clears throat> I had a student who did a thesis, PhD thesis, on distant healing. She was an Ayurvedic uh, physician. She didn't want to see you in her office. All her work was done at a distance. Yeah, it's a, it's a drag to have people come into your office. It's, they're distracting. <laughs> they distract you from getting to the real essence of what's going on. Yes. There's a big problem in science. The biggest problem in all of science is how did you develop from a single cell? We don't know. We have fields of developmental biology, we have embryology, they have studied, they have followed the development of organisms, they like to study frog embryos and chick embryos, and they describe what happens. How does it happen? We are taught DNA is the blueprint of life. It isn't. DNA is not the blueprint of life. We don't know where it is. Rupert Sheldrake thinks it's in the field. There are lots of people who agree. I want to figure out how that works. I want to reverse engineer the quantum information field so that we can regenerate limbs and organs. We should be able to do that. Robert Becker was off working on that, on regeneration of limbs. My next door neighbor in Woods Hole worked with Becker and they managed to regenerate, to do partial regeneration of a rat leg. A rat is a mammal. First regeneration in a mammal. They stopped working on that. 
we are crazy enough to send our young people to the Middle East to have their limbs blown off. We need to find out how to grow them back. Salamanders can do it. Why can't we? I want to figure it out. So there's skepticism about prayer and distant healing. It's flaky, twilight zone, new age, airy, fairy, gobbledygook, mumbo jumbo. Uh, there's skepticism about global warming. I can prove it. The vacuum of space may seem empty and boring, but it's teeming with activity. According to the laws of quantum mechanics, fluctuations of electromagnetic fields are omnipresent, even in empty space. So more and more people are realizing there's a lot going on in what we thought was the vacuum and emptiness. Memory in the fabric of space, preposterous idea, actually it's a very old idea, and it's written about by this incredible scholar, Irvin Laszlo, um, in this book, Science in the Akashic Field, I read every word of it. As far as I can determine, we are completely in agreement about the nature of the Akashic Field. Um, there are courses you can look up on the web. You can learn how to tap in to the memory of the Akashic records. Uh, mystics, meditators, and sages have long maintained that there exists an interconnecting cosmic field at the roots of reality that conserves and conveys information. Recent discoveries in vacuum physics show that this Akashic field is real and has its equivalent in science's zero-point field that underlies space itself. This is a sea of fluctuating energies from which all things arise. Atoms and galaxies, stars and planets, living beings, and consciousness. This is the zero-point Akashic field is the constant and enduring memory of the universe. It holds the record of all that has happened on Earth and in the cosmos and relates it all to that which is yet to happen. Good stuff. Oslo has written a recent book, Quantum Shift in the Global Brain. It's a radically new reality that's emerging. The only thing that we should not be surprised at is being surprised. Be ready to be surprised. This decade is the first in history that offers the choice between being the last decade of a fading, obsolete world or the first of a new and viable one. We got to pay attention to this. It's time to do it now. We much, may not have much more time to do this. One of my great interests is what the Sufis call kismet. It's your destiny. To me, the real purpose of healing, and I've worked with every type of therapist, every I've given keynote lectures of all of the schools of alternative medicine, just about all of them, and there's one thing that's more important than fixing people's sore backs, and that's helping people to figure out why they're here. Um, Mark Twain said, there are two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you figured out why you were born. Why are you here? And at some point in the last few years, I realized that I embody my destiny. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is why I'm here. This is how I got to be here with you folks. Um, when you're on your path, when you're following the path that you were put here to follow, the way I say it is, the wind will fill your sails. Everything will flow. The things you need will just come. And they do. They do. So notice how the things that you need, which seem improbable, be patient. They will show up. 
Anyone who still doubts that the world we live in is changing must be blind, obstinate, or just plain stupid. It reminds me of some political leaders. In other words, we need to understand the new reality that is emerging. We need to do it right away. The origin of form. How you developed from a single cell. Most important question in science. People think it's solved, it's not solved. We've been taught that DNA is the blueprint of life. It isn't. This book called The Triple Helix, which I don't know why it has a double helix on the cover. I haven't figured that out. Our ignorance of the generation of organic shape remains profound despite the progress made by molecular studies of development. What developmental genetics has done is to substitute a question that it can answer for the one that it cannot answer, but they didn't tell us about them making the switch. Pretty sneaky. How did this kitten develop from a single cell? How did you develop from a single cell? Where do all these different forms in nature come from? Rupert Sheldrake has an idea. It's called uh, morphic resonance, a resonance across time. Basically, it's that the bunny rabbit looks like a bunny rabbit by tapping into the record of all the structures of bunny rabbits that have ever happened in history. It's a resonance across time. It's a good idea. It was hugely criticized when he first proposed it, which was in 1981. In this book, A New Science of Life, Nature magazine said, this book is a good candidate for burning. A horrible thing to say about a scientist's sincere life's work. Uh, Sheldrake was at the water conference. I, uh, I talked to him. He did, he did a study of cats. When it's time to take your cat to the vet, you can't find the cat. They're gone. He did a study. Uh, he, he contacted 100 veterinarians in northern London, and he asked them if cats are on time for their appointments. 99 veterinarians said, no, they're never on time for their appointments. One veterinarian said, oh, they're always on time because they don't make appointments. You, the owner doesn't make the appointment. Just when it's time, grab the cat and run <laughs> before it has a chance to hide. So the criticism, such a field has never been measured, wrong. It's been measured. It's the scalar field. There's no evidence for it, wrong. There is evidence. Go to Sheldrake's website. You will see evidence. It's inconsistent with data from genetics and embryology. Well, genetics and embryology didn't solve the problem. It's, it is consistent with genetics and embryology, but it's different. These are weak arguments. Scientists do not like new ideas. So, memory. People without brains who can remember everything. The origin of form. Memory and morphology depend on resonance. I think that this is one of the best ideas around, worth, worth exploring to figure out how to regenerate limbs and organs. So I've been studying this for a long time. The pieces are coming together. This is Jerry Pollack, who organizes the Water Conference, University of uh, Washington in Seattle, the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. We're all located in wet and wonderful Seattle. He's a very good guy and very smart. Um, Pollocklab.org, fantastic research. Here's one example. Two beakers of water, put an electrode in each, pass a current, and this bridge forms. You can pull the beakers apart, and this bridge will stay there. What is going on there? What is happening? This is coherent water. 
So here's the exclusion zone adjacent to a uh, hydrophilic surface, a water living, water loving surface, and you put microspheres in the water, and after a while, this zone appears, the microspheres don't get in there. And after you wait a while, it gets bigger and bigger, the exclusion zone. And this is the, the structure of the water. It's hexagonally arranged oxygen and hydrogen atoms, layers, many, 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 many layers thick. This is new, new stuff. The, this is graphene. Graphene is part of this device that comes from Spain. It has on it, it has two features that I think are important. This is part of my talk where I take my clothes off. This is the design on the Pranan device. I looked it up, I counted the number of points, I put it in Google, and up came the flower of life. I had never heard of the flower of life. I'm a sheltered, shy scientist from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I never heard of sacred geometry. There it is. And I had a friend who does muscle testing. She tested my t-shirts with the flower of life. I am stronger when I wear these t-shirts, especially the one, ones with color. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Oslo, Norway, went to a Mexican restaurant, and I spilled some salsa on my flower of life t-shirt. Made me even stronger. It's more extra color. And I'm 80 years old, and I think when you're 80 years old, it's OK to spill stuff. So this is a very interesting material, graphene, which is part of the pranan device. There's the flower of life, and then there's, there are these mineral crystals. And they have the interesting property that when you have a layer, and then you have another layer, and they're offset, <coughs> it changes. It, it uh, changes the conductance. It's, so there may be a resonance between the pranan device and the structured water in the body, a resonance that enables the fields in the environment to support life instead of harm you. This is brand new, just two days ago. Uh, my friend Sharon sent me this. There it is. Easy. So at the uh, 2013 water conference, I made this suggestion that easy water <clears throat> does impedance matching. Match and this is matching of the velocity of electromagnetic fields in space with the velocity of electromagnetic fields in tissue. The fields slow down when they enter tissue. It's called impedance matching. And this allows information to flow to and from living structures. It's an idea. So here's a molecule. This is a, uh, an amino acid lysine. And there's the morphic field. And my suggestion was that these spinning water molecules allow an exchange of information between the morphic field, which is in all space everywhere, and which, by the way, is tensegris. So this is not only a good model for the structure of the human body, it's a good model for the structure of space. And information is stored, and if you want to know the technical name for it, it's the spin angular momentum of the struts in space. If you don't understand spin angular momentum, don't worry. Just ask Glenn. He'll explain the whole thing. 
Here's a very interesting patent. If you're interested in frequencies, uh, methods of, for determining therapeutic resonance frequencies, uh, patent issued in 2007. Um, she basically measured the length of genomes. The first one she worked on was the Lyme disease pathogen. Um, determine the length of the genome and work out a frequency that corresponds to that length. If you put that frequency into the body, the, the pathogen can't reproduce because its, its genome is wiggling, vibrating. It vibrates the genome because it's the resonant frequency of the genome. It turned out to be a high frequency, too high to produce with a device, so she used music theory and scaled the frequency down many octaves to a frequency in the sound range. It came out to something like 600 and some cycles per second, which turned out to be the rife frequency for uh, that organism. So doctors in Europe, I found out from our friend Hendrik, doctors in Europe, when they have a patient who has some bacterium that they can't figure out what to do to stop it from growing, send $25 to Charlene Bohm in Virginia. She sends them the resonant frequency. They apply the resonant frequency and the infection goes away. How about that? Very valuable patent. Thank you, Charlene. The fabric of space. What is this quantum information field? How does morphic resonance work? I'm, I'm the how does it work guy. I try to figure out how things work. And we're getting all kinds of information is fitting together to explain how the quantum information field stores data and can energize things. For example, there's this wonderful group of people that get together the Society for Scientific Exploration, SSE, and they explore the wackiest stuff. I love it. They really go for the anomalies. Glenn has been to some of those. And there's that other group, that the, the, uh, the people who do um, those weird devices with all the knobs. Radionics, the radionics people. Well, this is how this stuff works. The information field has infinite memory storage. It records events anywhere in the universe instantaneously. And the reason it can do that is the scalar field goes everywhere in the universe instantaneously. It does not have a velocity. It doesn't take time to get somewhere. This is why the founders of quantum physics didn't like it and took it out of the equations which are called the Maxwell equations that describe the electromagnetic field Maxwell had the scalar field in there. The, some of the physicists just didn't like it. They thought it was unphysical to have a field that went everywhere instantaneously. They couldn't handle that. Well, that was a problem. And it's true. Yeah, it's not a vector. A vector has direction and magnitude. The scalar field just has magnitude. So it's a scalar. It's a scalar. Like the temperature of a room yeah. is a scalar. It doesn't have a direction. It just is the way it is. So the information field is holographic, fractal, tensegris. It, in, it obeys the mathematics of phi, uh, which is sacred geometry. And it has this E8 symmetry, which I don't understand. But 
I met a guy in Germany who is from the great laboratory in Milan, and he understands E8 symmetry, and we are going to collaborate on solving the morphic field. I'm excited. Holography. A holographic image looks like a puddle in a rainstorm, like interference patterns, waves coming out and interfering with each other. So these are the pieces of the puzzle that fit together to describe a quantum information field. Uh, there's nothing wrong with any of these. They're all, there's a good literature on all of these. Um, holography, fractality, phi, tensegrity, and this is E8 symmetry. When I saw this, I was amazed. When I first saw this, I went, I, I said out loud, gasp, <laughs> look at that. I was blown away. If you want to know about it, here's a good video. Look up on, uh, on Google, Hacking Reality. It's an interesting movie. A lay person's guide to E8. Is there an eight dimensional engine behind our universe? Join Marion Kerr, she's a movie star. She's a very attractive woman who takes you on a fun, visually exciting journey exploring a mysterious, highly complex structure known as E8, a weird eight-dimensional mathematical object that for some strange reason appears to encode all of the particles and forces of our three-dimensional universe. So very interesting to watch. And here she is. Let's talk about infinity. And she's underwater. Water is an analogy here. Think immersed in the quantum information field. So here she is. Imagine opening your eyes and finding yourself surrounded by water and you cannot remember ever not being in that water. You can't remember ever not being in space. The first question you might ask is, how did I get here? You've always been there. What do you mean always? When did I enter the pool? When did I enter space? You never entered the pool. You have always been in the pool. You've always been in space. You've always been here. Okay, but where was I before I was in the pool? That's the first question. There is no before in which you were not in the pool. There is no before in which you were not in space. You have always been in the pool, and then to emphasize, she says, always. So there it is. That's my, the hidden symmetry of nature, gasp. What does that mean? Sacred geometry. The mathematics of space is sacred geometry. Very important recent development, the detection of gravity waves. This woman, Kelly Holly Brockelman, did a TEDx Nashville, Nashville presentation on the space-time symphony of gravitational waves. She's an astrophysicist, specialized in the study of black holes, um, she had this, a friend of her made this dress. These are gravity waves embroidered on the dress. The first gravity waves, Einstein predicted gravity waves 100 years ago. They finally got measured. They got measured with LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravital, Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, thousands of scientists, millions of dollars, National Science Foundation, Caltech, MIT, a big project, huge project. And two interferometers, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. This is the first gravity wave ever measured. 
very challenging technology. As of December 2018, they have me measured 11 gravitational waves. By having two separate interferometers, they can tell where the waves are coming from. They come from big cosmic events. So there they are. The, they send a light beam down each of these long pipes, basically. The light beams go down to the end and bounce back, down to the end and bounce back, and they see how the waves interfere with each other, and they can tell if a gravity wave has gone by. It's a change in dimensions. One part in 10 to the 21, one ten thousandth the width of a proton, the smallest distance measurement ever made. The mirrors are the smoothest ever made. And they have to use lots of light. The lasers they use are a thousand, a million, million watt laser. Enough energy to power a thousand homes. Air in the arms interferes, so they spent 40 days pumping out all of the air. Enough air to fill two and a half million footballs. Hmm. The best vacuum, second best vacuum in the world, the best vacuum being the vacuum at the large, whoops, Hadron Collider in Switzerland has an even better vacuum, the thing that they use to find the God particle, supposedly. She said this, you are matter, you move. All throughout life, you make gravitational waves. Every move you make, every choice you make throughout your life is making gravitational waves propagating away from you at the speed of light. And long after you are gone, that imprint you have made in the universe will continue to exist. Watch your language. Watch your thoughts. Watch what you think. You're affecting the whole universe. Your choices matter. They're going to be part of the universe. The things we do now are going to travel away from us as waves in the cosmos eventually reaching the stars we see in the Milky Way and beyond. Here's a recent paper, just came out, April of this year. So this is a current subject of great interest in physics. The universe probably remembers every single gravitational wave. It's published in Physical Review D. This is a scholarly academic physics journal, one of the leading physics journals in the world, and there it is. And they say, after the waves pass, they might leave a region slightly altered, leaving behind a sort of memory of their crossing. They called these changes persistent gravitational wave observables. So this is academic science looking at this incredible concept that the universe remembers. So this is an important picture of the dynamic structure of space and its role in biology and consciousness. The quantum information field has lots of names, quantum vacuum, quantum plenum, quantum information field, zero point field, subspace, the world substance, according to Descartes, the cosmic plenum, the ground state of the universe, universal consciousness, mind, higher mind, mediums call it the other side, the divine, the all, it's everything. Holographic universe. There are scholarly books describing the holographic universe. This is one that tells you how to wake up your holographic Holographic mind. Holographic universe, Michael Talbot. 
another book. This is serious work. Ask a physicist about the structure of space, and he'll say one of two things. One, he'll say, space has no structure. Space does not have a structure because we don't have any equations for it. That's ridiculous to think that something doesn't exist because you don't have equations for it. And it's wrong because we do have equations. Or the physicist will say, the vacuum is the central fundamental basis for the physical description of reality. It may become the foundation of the next era of the physical world picture. So this is what advanced physicists think. And here is a book that's full of equations. And the nice thing about this book is that it explains the equations in words that anybody can understand. It looks to me like the mathematicians have, for a, a century, have been making elaborate equations so that, that nobody understands. They're the only ones who understand these equations. It's job security. It's academic advancement. Uh, nobody knows what they're talking about. This book gives the equations and verbal descriptions of what they mean. Here's one, here's the geometric uh, universe, science, geometry, and the work of Roger Penrose. I didn't understand anything in this book. It has all these concepts that you have to understand. You have to be a mathematician to understand these things. It's, to me, it's a very high form of intellectual masturbation. Pullbacks of the cup product, the tangents. Of course, Glenn understands all these terms, right? But I don't. Here's some examples of the fabric. This is from a very popular book by Carlo Rivali. Here's a diagram of the fabric of space. This is the fabric that light follows. This is the gravitation. Gravity is the contour of space around massive objects. And then he has a little fine structure, which he just made up. We didn't know what to put there, but he put something. The Dirac Sea. If you want to know what this is, read P.A.M. Dirac's uh, Nobel lecture. He got the Nobel Prize. This is accepted in physics that particles form and annihilate each other and disappear. It looks like a net nothing is happening. It adds up to nothing. But space is a very busy place with all this going on. Here's another model of space. These are uh, pentagons and constantly evolving. It's not a homunculus. The homunculus was an idea that biologists had um, 100 years ago that every sperm contains a mid, middle, miniature human being. Every sperm has a person in it. That idea didn't last. It's not a homunculus. It's not a miniature being. It's a code, and we need to crack the code. Homeopathy. This is Luc Montagnier, who goes to the water conferences. He does homeopathic, homeopathic dilutions, succussions, and he uses a vortex mix, mixer. When I saw this, I said, aha, here's what's really going on. What's going on is the molecules are being vortexed so that they go straight into the vortex of space. Homeopathy is having a lot of problems. Homeop homeopathic techniques, succussion, the fact that diluting the substance makes it more powerful doesn't make sense. There's lots of efforts in the US and the UK to abolish homeopathy, even though it is the most successful medical system in the world. Hundreds of millions of people 
use homeopathy for their primary care. It can, one treatment can heal a disorder or a disease. It works for animals for which placebo effects can't work. So I got the idea from Luke's talk that what's really happening in homeopathy is not transferring the signature of the remedy molecule to water, it's transferring the signature of the remedy molecule into space, into the vortical structure of space. And the more you succuss it, the more you dilute it, the more you spin it or bang it on the Bible or bang it on the table, the more you do that, the stronger the memory is in space, so it appears to make the remedy more effective. Biology confirms the vortex structure of space and light. And this is the paper we published in the Journal of Vortex Science and Technology. You can read this uh, on my website, energyresearch.us. And at the basic rec recognition, there's a layer in the eye right under the corneal epithelium. The epithelium, if you scratch your eye, you scratch the epithelium and it regenerates in two days. So if you get a scratch on your eye, don't worry. It'll go away in a couple of days. Right underneath there is a very tough layer called the stroma. And it has a plywood-like structure. It's got fibers running one way, then the next layer, the fibers run a different way, and so on down through the structure. It's ideally designed to allow light to vortex into the eye. The structure is very important. If you change the geometry of the corneal stroma, you can't see. It becomes opaque. So it's perfect for light to sp spiral into the eye. And it turns out that the light spirals into both eyes in a right-handed helix. This goes against a basic law in biology, the law of bilateral asymmetry. Your ear, right ear and your left ear are not the same. So according to that law of asymmetry, the structure should be different in the two eyes to allow you to see, it isn't. It's the same in both eyes, you can see. And this, I think, shows that light spirals through space and into the eye. Both the fabric of space and the fabric of the body have spiral grains. It's interesting that a lot of therapies recognize that if you have an impact, you can, you can get rid of it by sort of vortexing it out. And the same is true of this structure. When you push on it, it has a rotation. This is Vladimir Ginsberg. This is a very interesting book to read, The Spiral Grain of the Universe. He's actually written five books on the spiral grain of the universe. As far as I can determine from looking at Amazon, nobody reads these books, except me. They're very interesting. And this latest one, uh, I've written a piece for it. Uh, I got very interested, it happened this way. I was very, I got my start in alternative medicine by through rolfing. And I had a student who uh, told me about rolfing. I got a bad back from bending over the electron microscope for 20 years, twiddling knobs and looking down into the screen of the binocular microscope. I decided to try rolfing for my back, and it worked. And the guy I went to see was Ida Rolf's first teacher of Rolfing. And he was a very interesting guy. 
I wish I had a recording of all the stories. Rolfing is a deep tissue manipulation um, developed by Ida P. Rolf, PhD, and it's a worldwide um, set of practitioners who do Basically, her discovery is the body is a plastic medium. You can change the structure of the body. And a lot of people are bent over or out of balance, left to right or twisted. All that can be manipulated and corrected and lots of problems go away. So that's where I got my start. I. Uh, took a class in rolfing to find out what the paradigm was. I didn't learn to be a rolfer. I wanted to see what they thought they were doing. And that was very interesting. And at one point in the class, one of the teachers called me over and one of the models that they were practicing on was lying on a treatment table. And he said, look at the hair. See the vortex in the hair? Everybody has that vortex in the hair, the top of their head. Just look at people's heads and you'll see that vortex. He said, that goes right down through the body. I said, what? I had to figure out what he was talking about. It took me 30 years to figure it out. Just waiting for answers, little pieces of the puzzle. One piece of the puzzle, uh, <clears throat> I was at the beach in Woods Hole where the scientists gather and write their equations in the sand and solve big problems. And I started to talk to this guy about the vortex and he said, oh yeah. He said, the spinal cord does a vortex when it comes up into the brainstem. I have never found any evidence for that, but he seemed to know what he was talking about. He turned me on to an article from the 1920s by a guy who asked people to walk in a straight line. He did this on like a football field or a baseball field. He would blindfold them, tell them walk in a straight line, and he'd see what they did. And they would walk straight for a while and then they'd start to go in a helix all the time. He's, he went out west to a cornfield and put people in cars and blindfolded them and told them to drive straight ahead. They drove straight ahead for a while and then they started doing this. He said there's something fundamentally vortical or spiral in the brain. Didn't know what it was. This is why people get lost in the woods. They go, they think they're going in a straight line and after a while they're going off and they end up where they started. <coughs> So anyway, I started to look for what is, what is this? What is this? And eventually I learned that one of the th ways we are formed is from a vortex of energy that comes down through the sh crown chakra and goes right through us. One piece of the puzzle is that the heart does not pump the blood. And there are scholarly articles on that subject. And what does make the blood move? It moves of its own momentum. And it picks up this energy that comes vortexing down through our bodies. <clears throat> and it is well known in the martial arts. It took me a while to find this out because martial arts people don't brag, usually. Um, I met a little guy who said he likes to be attacked by a mob of people. And he just imagines this vortex coming down through the crown chakra and creating a field around him and they can't touch him. They come charging at him and they just can't get to him. And finally I found after a long search I found a video on the web of the founder of Aikido um, doing a demonstration. He had seven 
judo masters attack him. And they came in at him, and he went like this, and they were all on the floor. So this is, this is real. This is a real thing that people can use if you want to avoid an attacker. And it goes right down through the core of the body. Sacred geometry, it's actually the geometry of the quantum vacuum. The mathematics of space, the golden ratio, or phi, this has been talked about down through the ages. Some of the smartest people in history have tried to figure out why this ratio is so important, 1.618 so, and so on. The golden ratio, the golden mean, phi, used in architecture. And in 2010, this group of scientists reported a decade-long study showing that solid matter has quantum properties defined by the golden ratio. This is E8, famous from art and architecture. They published in the journal Science. What they did was they made wires of a magnetic atom called niobium, a cobalt, called cobalt niobate. They're magnetic atoms. It acts like a quantum scale guitar string. They plucked the guitar string with a magnetic field and it went boing and the frequencies that came out we found a series of resonant notes. The first two notes show a perfect relationship with each other. Their frequencies are in the ratio of 1.618, the golden ratio, famous from art and arch architecture. It reflects a beautiful property of the quantum system, a hidden symmetry, quite a special one called E8 by mathematicians. And this was the first observation in a material so this is the geometry of space. Sacred geometry, which is, you can find symbols like the flower of life on ancient temples, thousands of years old, in every culture in the world. The ancients knew that this formula, this geometry was extremely important. Here's another example the ratios of these, uh, the radii of these um, elements follows the golden ratio. This is the Mandelbrot set. Mandelbrot made a breakthrough in geometry. All the ge geometricians hated it because it didn't fit with what they learned in school. But when he started to use his mathematics to make animations for Star Wars. It got accepted and the mathematics of the Mandelbrot set is the mathematics of space and will help us solve the equations for sacred geometry and for the morphic field. Fractality is recursive. Have you ever been in an elevator where there was a mirror on both walls? And you see a reflection of yourself and a reflection of your reflection and a reflection of that. And then you look down the line and you try to see how far it goes. And you get down to the end and kind of blurs. I'm always trying to find the end. The pattern repeats itself in an infinite series of scales. The word I say goes into space and is repeated infinitely through many scales of size all through the universe. People lacking brains, extracorporeal mind, memory outside of the head, morphic fields, homeopathic potentization, phi, gravity waves leaving traces in space. Does this story fit together to account for the anomalies of people without brains? E8. And that's my email and what it means to me is if you have a question 
you can find the answer. You may have to wait. If you have questions about growing plants, if you have questions about your relationship, your specific detailed relationship of your consciousness with the consciousness of the plant, if you have questions about that and you want to map out the deep, deep aspects of your relationship with plants, you, you can do that. And let me know how you're doing with that. I like gadgets. I, what got me into electron microscopy, <clears throat> when I was uh, in school, they gave us a tablet and a pencil. And they tried to teach us things. I didn't pay any attention to the teacher. I felt that school was my punishment for being a child. I wanted to be outside. So instead of listening to the teacher, I would make drawings of very elaborate gadgets with knobs and dials and screens and meters. And, and I did that all through grade school. And then I found the electron microscope. And it had a lot of knobs and dials and gadgets. I was in knob heaven with the electron microscope. And it all fit together. It all just made total sense. Here's what I think. I think healing work involves, most importantly, helping people figure out why they're here. Nothing could be more valuable for anyone than to do that. So that's kind of why I'm here, is to try to figure that out. And it doesn't, <clears throat> the question is not answered by logical thought. The question is answered by insights, um, flashes of insight. I wrote a paper with a psychiatrist, Mari Pressman, famous psychiatrist. Mari and I were very interested in athletes. I got interested in athletic performance because I watched this figure skater, uh, Midori Ito. She won gold medals in the Olympics. She was the first woman to do a triple axle double jump in the Olympics. She was amazing, but she was very calm and peaceful. And it was thrilling to watch her perform. It blew my mind. I had to write a book about performance because of Midori Ito. And Mari Pressman was very interested in the same thing because he was the first psychiatrist to hypnotize Olympic figure skaters. He hypnotized them. He had them do mental rehearsals. He cut through their psychological blocks to having a perfect performance. He was very successful. We wrote a paper on a quantum basis for the unconscious mind. And basically, the story is the unconscious mind is vast. And if you want to solve a problem, a difficult problem, let your unconscious do it. You will not get there by thinking logically. 